In various essays, I've argued that almost all philosophy of art in the modern period has presupposed what I have called the grand modern narrative of the arts. Rather pretentious title, but it's a rather pretentious movement, so um, um, not, not only has philosophy of art presupposed that narrative, the same is true of almost all history of art, especially history of visual art, and of almost all theology of art. These two have presupposed the grand modern narrative. And so, of course, almost all discussions by philosophers, theologians, and art historians about art and religion have presupposed the grand narrative. It's my view that the grand modern narrative must be discarded, in part but by no means only because the narrative is a powerful hindrance to an accurate and adequate understanding of the interaction between art and religion. I hold that we must rethink art. To get to the point where I can explain what that rethinking might look like, I must briefly present to you the narrative that, in my view, must be discarded. On this occasion, I'll have to forego offering evidence for my claim that this narrative has indeed been the presupposed context of almost all philosophical, theological, and historical thinking and writing about the arts in the modern period. My guess, however, is that for most of you, maybe all, the narrative is going to have the ring of familiarity. Some of what I say will necessarily be a repetition of what I have already said in essays that, from correspondence with Professor State, Spate, I gather some of you have read. Um, for those of you who have read those essays, I hope that the repetition doesn't bore you. It's generally agreed that revolutionary changes took place in 18th century Western Europe and how the arts were engaged, and that those changes both evoked and reflected changes in ways of thinking about the arts. What the grand narrative then does is place those 18th century changes in practice and thought within a larger historical and social framework. To grasp the narrative then, we first have to get in hand the more important of the changes for which the narrative provides that interpretative framework. In a pair of superb essays, the literary historian M. H. Abrams argues that the most fundamental change that took place in the 18th century was the emergence into prominence among the bourgeoisie of Western Europe of contemplation as a way of engaging those media that we now call the arts. And the corresponding emergence into prominence among writers on the arts of what Abrams calls the contemplation model. So let me make a few com comments about each of those points, the emergence of, into prominence of contemplation and among writers of the contemplation model. <laughs> Two features of 18th century Western European society which created the space needed for the former of these changes, this new way of engaging art, to take place. Two features were the presence of a sizable middle class with a fair amount of leisure time on its hands and the existence of a civil society where citizens could engage in activities that were not sponsored by the church and were, in that sense, secular. In the space created by these two emerging phenomena, a middle class with leisure time and a secular civil society, contemplation as a way of engaging works of the arts came into prominence. What was new in the 18th century, let's be clear, was not that the arts foot first put in their appearance in European society generally. The arts had always been there. Nor did contemplation as a way of engaging works of the arts first put in its appearance then and there. That had always been one of the ways in which the arts were engaged. What was new in the 18th century, to repeat, was the emergence into prominence among the newly emerging middle class of contemplation as a way of engaging works of the arts in secular civil society. <laughs> Though the ancient Greeks did not have our concept of the arts, writing in the West about the media that we know now call the arts, does go back, in fact, into Greek antiquity. Abrams observes that before the 18th century, such writing was, for the most part, focused on practices of making, Aristotle's poetics, for example. Writers offer, offered advice to poets, musicians, painters, architects, and so forth, on how to practice their craft. But then, Abrams argues, early in the 18th century, the emphasis in writing on the art shifted from the artist who makes the work 
to the public which engages it. And that shift from artist, that shift from artist to public was not enough all by itself to make the contemplation model dominant, since there are many ways in addition to contemplation for the public, obviously, to engage works of the arts. The altarpieces of the medieval Western church, for example, were caught up into the practices of Catholic piety. The 18th century writers about the arts would have known, of course, of this devotional way of engaging painting and sculpture, but they paid it, I say here, no attention, and so far as I know, that's true, they paid it no attention. Art, they assumed and said, is for contemplation. Parenthetically, it's important that we not be misled by the visual connotations of the word contemplation. The contemplation model was employed not just for talking about visual art, but for discussing the arts in general. Now one can contemplate some work of the arts for different, many different reasons. One can attend carefully to some painting, for example, in order to decide whether or not to bid on it at auction. The 18th century writers had no interest in that sort of contemplation other than to set it off to the side. They had their eye on what came to be called disinterested contemplation. And what is that? The 18th century writers spent a lot of, spilled a lot of ink wrestling with that question. The idea now seems quite simple, probably hindsight helps. To engage in disinterested contemplation of some work of the arts is to do so for the sake of the act itself, rather than for the sake of bringing something else about. It is for one's act of contemplation to be an end in itself in the structure of one's activity. Now, if engaging works of the arts as objects of disinterested contemplation was to become, was to become common and widespread, it needed an institutional base. And so it was that what we now know as the art world began to develop in the 18th century. Here is how Abrams summarizes his discussion. He's got a lengthy discussion. Discussion of the emergence of the basic elements of our modern art world. I quote him. What we find, beginning late in the 17th century, is the emergence of an astonishing number of institutions for making a diversity of human artifacts public as commodities, usually for pay, in order to satisfy a burgeoning demand for the delights, but also for the dis social distinction of connoisseurship." End of the quote. So work satisfying this demand were taken from wherever they were found, quoting again, pulled out of their intended contexts, stripped of their diverse religious, social, and political functions, and given a single and uniform new role as items to be read or listened to or looked at simply as a poem, a musical piece, a statue, a painting. End of the quote from Abrams. Well, it was these changes in practice and thought, ever so briefly described here, for which the grand modern narrative of the arts provided the social and historical framework. So let's turn to the narrative itself. And I'm going to divide the narrative into two chapters. The main theme of the first chapter is that the arts finally came into their own in the 18th century, thereby attaining their historical destiny. The arts are always changing. The story of what happened in the 18th century could be told simply as a story of a rather extraordinary change in how the arts are engaged by the public. But that's not how the grand nar narrative tells the story of the changes. It tells it as a story of progress. The grand narrative is a progressivist, Whiggish narrative. And more even than that, it not only describes the changes as progress, it characterizes the progress as consisting of the arts coming into their own, coming into their majority, as it were. No further progress is to be expected, other than that more people spend more time engaging works of the arts as objects of disinterested contemplation. And what basis does the grand narrative have for claiming that the arts come into their own insofar as they are engaged by the public as objects of disinterested contemplation and made and presented for that purpose? Why is the veneration by the orthodox of their icons not an example of art coming to its own? <clears throat> 
The icons are made, after all, exactly for that purpose. What defense can be given for holding that is only when the icon is contemplated disinterestedly, maybe after having been removed from the church and hung in a museum, that it's an example of art coming to its own. Pretty clearly the clue lies in that concept of disinterestedness. Recall that when I contemplate something disinterestedly, my contemplation is for the sake of the act itself, not for the sake of bringing something else about. So the grand narrative assumes that to engage a work of the arts in any, any way other than as an object of disinterested contemplation is to engage it for the sake of bringing something else about. And secondly, it assumes that the arts come into their own when works of the arts are engaged for the sake of the act itself, not for the sake of bringing, hoping, bringing something about. The idea has often been expressed by saying that to engage a work of the arts as an object of disinterested contemplation is to engage it as a work of art. In contrast, then, to engaging it as something that will deepen one's piety, as something that will be emotionally uplifting, on and on. The 18th century revolution was thus seen by the writers of the narrative as liberation for the arts. Liberation from all those modes of engagement with works of art that prevented the arts from coming into their own. And then liberation for the arts to follow whatever be the dynamics at work when they do come into their own. In short, the grand narrative catches up the arts into that immensely popular narrative of modernity, which says that modernity represents freedom and liberation. That was the first chapter, the arts finally come into their own. Now for the second chapter. Once the idea was firmly in place that the arts come into their own, came into their own in the 18th century, when works of arts were increasingly engaged as objects of disinterest, in, disinterested contemplation, writers on the arts in the course of the century began to shift their attention from the activity of disinterested contemplation by the public, that's what uh, Abrams has em emphasized, to an analysis of the works that reward such engagement, and to an analysis of the artist's experience of making works for that purpose. And once that shift from contemplation to makers and works, once that shift had happened, the grand progressivist narrative about art having come into its own became, as I think of it, yet more grand by appropriating and incorporating the social analysis of the Romantics. The early Romantics were the first great secular analysts and critics of modernity. The first to believe that the 17th and the 18th century social developments represented something distinctly new and different. And the first to get not just recent, but something brand new. And the first to give a secular analysis and critique of those developments. Their analysis was that the coming of modernity represents the destruction of all the old social and psychological unities, and that what drives this process is the spread of what Max Weber, a century later, would call instrumental rationality. I love the line from John Keats in his long poem, Lamia, not a very good poem, but a marvelous passage. He's talking about what he calls philosophy. He actually, philosophy meant natural science still in those days. Here's what he says. Philosophy unweaves the rainbow. See where that comes to? It just split, analyzes it, splits it apart, unweaves the rainbow. The idea was, however, that the instrumental rationality that drives modernization has not been all conquering. Not all unities have been destroyed. When the arts are liberated from subservience to extraneous purposes, and freed to come into their own, then the work of art itself, along with the creation of the work and the disinterested contemplation thereof by the public, constitute exceptions to the social dynamics of rationalization and fragmentation. Such works, such creations, such engagement are accordingly socially other and transcendent. Here's the thought. Artistic creation is the product of imagination, 
not of instrumental rationality. And essential to the very being of a work of art, so it was said, is that it be unified. So in the midst of all this social fragmentation and intellectual, the artist brings forth unity, a unity constituted of what was called internal finality rather than external, serving some external purpose, of interior rationality rather than instrumental, of, purpose of purposiveness without purpose, as Kant called it. And we who engage in contemplation for its own sake come under the sway of the transcendent otherness of that work of art. And ever since the early days of Romanticism, writers have gone on to say that by virtue of freely creating and presenting his work of imagined unity and interior as opposed to instrumental rationality, the artist launches an implicit critique against the fragmentation, rationalization, and oppression of modern bourgeois society by setting before us an image of an alternative social reality. The work of art thereby, there, thereby harbors within itself the potential for being an agent of social reform. Art is salvific in its powers, redemptive, not by transporting us from this fallen world into a better world, but by harboring within itself the prophetic messianic potential of provoking and guiding the reformation of this present fallen world, art is the social avant-garde. It is these convictions that lie behind the following words by the normally very sober Herbert Marcuse from the Frankfurt School. Here's what Marcuse said. This summarizes a good deal of what I've been saying. The radical qualities of art, that is to say its indictment of the established reality and its invocation of the beautiful image of liberation, are grounded precisely in the dimensions where art transcends its social determination and emancipates itself from the given universe of discourse and behavior while preserving its overwhelming presence. The inner logic of the work of art terminates in the emergence of another reason, another sensibility, which defy the rationality and sensibility incorporated in the dominant social institutions. The idea of the social transcendence of art comes through powerfully there. The attitude towards religion, towards religion of those who embrace these claims of art, social otherness, and transcendence, has always been ambivalent. On the one hand, institutional religion is part of the bourgeois rationalized social order that art transcends and critiques. On the other hand, over and over, religious import of one sort and another has been ascribed to art by virtue of its social transcendence. From a great many passages that I could quote on this point expressing the, well, I call it the religiosity of art, let me select just two. Here's one, one uh, from Wilhelm Wackenroder, a friend of, um, of Carl Philip Moritz and Goethe, writing in the late 1700s. He's talking about the museum experience. Art galleries ought to be temples where, in still and silent humility and in heart-lifting solitude, we may admire great artists as the highest among mortals with long, steadfast contemplation of their works. I compare the enjoyment of nobler works of art to prayer. Works of art, in their way, no more fit into the common flow of life than does the thought of God. That day is, for me, a sacred holiday which I devote to the contemplation of noble works of art. And here's a passage from Clive Bell's art. Bell is publishing this in 1914. This comes mainly from the second chapter of Bell's book on art. In the standard aesthetics anthologies, the first chapter is include, included, but rarely the second chapter. In the first chapter, he talks about art moving us as an end in itself. And now in the second chapter, he asks, and why is that? If an object considered as an end in itself moves us more profoundly, that is, has greater significance, then the same object considered as a means to practical ends, or as a thing related to human interests, and this undoubtedly is the case, we can only suppose that when we consider anything as an end in itself, we, make, we become aware of that in it which is of greater moment than any qualities it may have acquired 
in keeping company with us human beings. Instead of recognizing its accidental and conditioned importance, we become aware of its essential reality, of the God in everything, of the universal in the particular, of the all-pervading rhythm. Call it by what name you will. The thing that I'm talking about is that which lies behind the appearance of all things, that which gives to all things their individual significance, the thing in itself, the ultimate reality. Incidentally, incidentally, I think Bell was one of the, well, it's a little bit over the top, but one of the great writers of the English language. Bell goes on to say that, quote, between aesthetic and religious rapture, aesthetic and religious rapture, there is a family alliance. The physical universe, for both the artist and the mystic, is a means to ecstasy. Art and mystical religion belong to the same world, and the kingdom of neither is of this world. Well, Wachenroder, Bell, Marcuse, take your pick. Works of the arts are themselves godlike. Works of the arts put us in touch with ultimate reality. Call it what you will. Works of the arts are salvific. Um, take your pick. That was the grand narrative. Now, with that description of the grand narrative in hand, I want now to take note of recent developments internal to the modern art world which have made the grand narrative lose whatever plausibility it may once have had. <laughs> so those, those will be in effect historical comments. But before I do that, let me say something, speaking as a philosopher, about the claim of the grand narrative that insofar as disinterested perceptual contemplation becomes prominent in how the arts are engaged, insofar as that happens, art progresses to the point where it reaches its historical destiny, its telos. Look, we all believe that there has been pro progress in theoretical physics. If asked why we think that, we would presumably point to the fact that physics leaves large parts of its past behind to be studied by historians of phys physics, not by physicists, and that those parts which it does not leave behind, it somehow incorporates into its new extent, present theories. By contrast, philosophy neither leaves behind its past, nor does it fully incorporate its past. We keep on studying it. Now and then a philosophical movement such as log logical positivism comes along which claims that it has finally, after all these centuries, millennia actually, discovered the secret to progress in philosophy. Um, and the early 20th century was full of such manifestos. But without fail, those grandiose movements are either put to death or they just die off. Logical positivism is now no more than a memory. Most people in this room will not have read a word by a logical positivist. When I was in grad school, you couldn't avoid it. There isn't any overall progress in philosophy. Now consider the arts. If it were true that art progresses to the point of reaching its historical destiny, insofar as disinterested contemplation becomes prominent in how works of the arts are engaged, one would expect that, like physics, other modes of engaging works of the arts would either have disappeared or would become brackish backwaters. Nothing of the sort has happened. Liturgical art remains, so far as I can see, about as vital as ever, as do memorial art and social protest art. It's true that work songs no longer play much of a role in modernized societies, but that's because there's not much work in modernized societies that invites singing while working. Um, um, I don't sing while working at my computer, and my uh, guess is that most of you don't either. Now, defenders of the grand narrative on this point will be inclined to reply by repeating the argument I mentioned earlier, that, be all this as it may, it remains true that when we engage a work of art as an object of disinterested contemplation, we do so for the sake of the act itself, not so as to bring about something else. That's true. Okay. But here's my point. How do we get from that observation to the conclusion that this represents art coming to its own? I submit that there is no way to get from that observation to that conclusion. Now to recent developments. In his fascinating book, Art History After Modernism, the uh, German-American art historian Hans Belting does two things. He brings to light the aims and assumptions of art history, that is, in this case, of visual art history, 
and he traces the undermining of those aims and assumptions by developments in the art world in the latter part of the uh, 20th century. He talks about the end of art history. Let me briefly summarize his line of thought on these two points. On Belting's telling, what made art history possible was exactly the changes that took place in 18th century Western Europe and how the arts were engaged, plus the emergence of what I've called the grand modern narrative as a set of claims about the significance of those changes, along with an aestheticist interpretation of, of what it is about disinterested contemplation that makes it important or getting in touch with the aesthetic qualities of the object. Let me quote Belting. Our history could be narrated only where art was thought to have reached its proper destiny in the course of history and had thus manifested its definition or its proper destination in universal terms. Uh, end of the quote. Parenthetically, I should note that the term grand modern narrative of the arts is my term, not Belting's. He doesn't name the phenomenon, but he describes it. <laughs> When the European bourgeoisie of the 18th century began to prize disinterested contemplation as a way of engaging works of visual art, they did not confine themselves to works produced for that purpose in their own time and place. They built public museums, and they stocked these museums, as we all know, with works that they took from wherever they found them that they judged would reward this mode of engagement, whether or not those works had been made for that purpose. They call these works fine art, or often just art. Quoting Belting, pictures inside the museum attained the status of art, while pictures that remained outside were forever distinguished as profane, banal, and artless. The old works paid with the loss of their social use to enter the collections and thus become art. And then Belting goes on to observe that art history, his own field, emerged more or less simultaneously with, with the construction of the first public museums, and he argues as their essential counterpart. He says the art museum was the spatial equivalent of the time scheme of art history. Now this new history had no interest in narrating the ways in which the works assembled in the museum had formerly been embedded in their own society and culture. Its interest in these works was only as abstracted from their original social and cultural contexts and now assembled together to function as objects of disinterested contemplation. And the fact that they were capable of serving this function gave them, so it was assumed, a timeless and universal significance. This is Belting. A history of, I'm moving in and out of quotations here, a history of painting and sculpture to be a history of art with a capital A a history of fine art would have to be a history of this timeless and universal significance. It would have to be a history tracing evolution, tradition, and innovation within the autonomous and linear course of art. Given the framework of the grand narrative, what else would such a history do, right? Only such a history would be a history of painting and sculpture qua art. Such a history would be an aesthetic history of painting and sculpture. And what would an aesthetic history of painting and sculpture be? It would be a history of aesthetic style. I quote Belting, style was that quality of art for which a logical evolution was to be traced. What guided art history was the model of an art history with an internal logic, describing shifts of style from one period to another. Aesthetic style is the frame, as Belting calls it, through which art history looks and looked at painting and sculpture. It takes note only of those works that fit within the frame, and what it sees in those works is only what can be seen when, it's, when you look through the frame. And having described the aims and assumptions on which his own field of art history was founded and practiced, Belting goes on to argue that those aims and assumptions are no longer tenable in the face of recent developments in the visual art world and that his field of art history has accordingly come to an end. Belting hasn't yet retired, so um, you know, one wonders what he's going to do now. <laughs> 
Art history had not only assembled those paintings and sculptures from other times and places that fitted within its frame of aesthetic style, it also claimed to be able to continue its story of the evolution of aesthetic style in painting and sculpture into the present time. But what is now displayed for viewing in museums and galleries can no longer be fitted within the frame of the evolution of aesthetic style in painting and sculpture. Much of it is neither painting nor sculpture. Light shows, installations, video art, body art, performance art, stuffed animals, animals in formaldehyde, earthwork art, on and on. And a great deal that can still be classified as either painting or sculpture is deliberately aim aimed at undermining the idea of art as socially other and transcendent. Two of the most startling and influential developments, uh, examples of these developments are the following. In 1917, Marcel Duchamp presented for display in the exhibition of the Society of Independent Artists, an ordinary male urinal, which he titled Fountain, and which he signed R period Mutt, M-U-T-T. The exhibition committee had agreed to be thoroughly democratic and to accept for exhibit whatever was presented. So they were trapped. Duchamp's fountain was exhibited. Now and then one comes across writers declaiming on the aesthetic qualities of fountain. But that laughably misses the point. Duchamp did not intend that his work would receive mention in the history of the evolution of aesthetic style in the visual arts. In 1962, he wrote to Hans Richter, when I discovered ready-mades, uh, I mean this urinal was one of his ready-mades, I thought to discourage aesthetics. I threw the bottle rack and the urinal in their faces as a challenge, and now they admire them for their aesthetic beauty. Close of quote. Fountain is about art. It's a witty challenge to the hegemony of the aesthetic and to the insistence that art must be useless or it's not art. Urinal is a critique of claims made about art, those grand narrative claims about art, embedded in this case in an ordinary physical object rather than in a philosophical text. Of course, you couldn't know just by looking at it that that's what it was, a critique of claims made about art. One had to know or surmise what it meant. An event that was very nearly as startling and influential as Duchamp's urinal of 1917 was Andy Warhol's Brillo box sculpture, exhibited in 1964 in the Stable Gallery in New York City. The philosopher critic Arthur Danto says about Warhol's Brillo box that it awakened him to the fact that something very new was happening in the art world. He later described what was happening as the end of art. He and Belting are close friends. I myself think that it was Duchamp's urinal rather than Warhol's Brillo box that initiated the end of art. But I guess there can be no doubt that whereas Duchamp's work released a trickle of things that followed, Warhol's released a flood. Return for a moment to, then to Belting's observation that the public museum and art history emerged more or less simultaneously and worked as a pair with art history offering a stylistic narrative of the works that the museum collected and displayed. So that the two together decided which works qualified as art or fine art. And the art world in the 19th century, early 20th century, was an oriented around these, the practice of art history and the institution of the museum. But then what happened is that in the latter part of the 20th century, the art, the art world began to go its own way and to find a life of its own. It, it began to present for viewing things and events that were not fine art, as the museums understood fine art. And that did not and could not fit into any history whatsoever of aesthetic stylistics. Now in theory it would have been possible for the museum directors and the art historians to ma maintain their hegemony and just re reject what I will call now the Duchamp Warhol line as not art, not serious, degenerate, insidious, the undermining of all that is good and beautiful in art, and so forth. And a good many people have, in fact, described the Duchamp Warhol line in exactly those words. But here's what happened. The dynamics of the art world proved to be too powerful to be contained by art museum directors and art historians trying to retain their hegemony. <laughs> 
I argued earlier that one of the fundamental theses of the grand modern narrative never was correct. From the large number of different ways in which we human beings engage works of art, the narrative, to repeat, singles out engaging works of object, as objects of disinterested contemplation and then declares that arts progress to the point of reaching their historical destiny insofar as that mode of engagement gains prominence. And I argue that there's no reason to accept that claim of reaching historical destiny. But not only did the narrative make that prejudicial comparison between engaging works of art as objects of disinterested contemplation and all the other ways of engaging works of the arts, it also made claims about the nature and worth of that mode of engagement and claims about those works of art that satisfy that mode of engagement. And those claims, those romantic claims and so forth, patently do not fit what has happened in the world of the visual arts over the past 50 some years. Those claims just do not fit the Duchamp war whole line. So we need a new way of thinking about the arts, along with a new way of thinking about what is nowadays presented to us for viewing. What might that new way of thinking look like? Let me make some suggestions, and again, I'm going to have to be <laughs> brief. As I observed above, we human beings engage works of the arts in many different ways. And the grand narrative offered a rationale for ignoring, ignoring all but one of those, namely disinterested contemplation. Disinterested contemplation, so it said, represents art coming to its own, attaining its historical destiny. And so it was that those who accepted the grand narrative have ignored all other ways of engaging works of the arts. If the butterfly has emerged from its cocoon, why look at the cocoon when you can study and admire the butterfly? But if we reject that rationale as untenable, then I submit that other ways of engaging works of the arts beg for systematic attention by writers and thinkers. Down through the ages and on today, on to today, human beings have created works of the arts, especially works of the visual arts, as memorials of persons and events that they want to hold in memory and honor. The Vietnam War Memorial is now the most famous of the 20th century. For 1,500 years, members of the Eastern Orthodox Church have venerated icons. For a thousand years, Catholics have sung Gregorian chants and enriched their churches and cathedrals with sculptures and paintings. For 500 years, Protestants have sung hymns. Over and over, works of literature, like Uncle Tom's Cabin, have played a prominent role in social protest movements. Now, there are some ways of engaging works of art that are, of course, insignificant. But the ways that I've just now mentioned, along with many that I have not, are far from insignificant. For many Orthodox persons, the veneration of icons is of far more importance than gazing disinterestedly at paintings hanging in museums. So how do, we, how do we go about implementing this broader vision? We know how to think about museum art and concert hall music. We've been doing that for more than 200 years now. But how do we think about memorial art? How do we think about icons and hymns? How do we think about social protest art? How do we think about work songs, works, uh, uh, songs meant to accompany work? What categories shall we use? Let me make two suggestions. I pointed to a few of the many ways in which we engage, work, engage works of the arts, a few of the many ways in which they enter into human life and action. A good many of us, including myself, contemplate works of art disinterestedly, but the Orthodox don't contemplate their icons disinterestedly, they venerate them. Protestants don't contemplate their hymns disinterestedly, they sing them. People who visit the Vietnam Memorial in Washington do not contemplate it disinterestedly. They descend into it, they touch it, and they cry. Notice now that in performing these actions of contemplation, of veneration, of sinking, singing, of touching and crying and so forth. We are not just performing individual actions that can be grouped together into types on the basis of their resemblances. These here all resemble each other in being examples of contemplation. Those there all resemble each other in being examples of veneration and so forth. It's not just, these types are not just after the fact, 
Rather, in performing these actions, we are employing a social practice, a way of doing things that is learned by being handed down from those who are already practitioners to those who are not yet practitioners. Among the things handed down being how to tell the difference between better and worse ways of employing this way of doing things, this way of playing the violin, this way of painting, and so forth. Disinterested contemplation of works of the arts is among us in the modern West a social practice. We learn it. Veneration of icons is among the Orthodox a social practice. They learn it. So my first proposal is that when we think about the arts, we place at the center of our attention not individual works of the arts, but rather the social practices of art. The works emerge from the practices. They are engaged within the practices. But more specifically, I suggest that we think of each of the arts, the visual arts, music, and so forth, as a complex of three types of practices, these being related in multiple ways. In each of the arts, we find practices of composition, practices of performance or display, and practices of public engagement. Young would-be painters in the West learn the practice of painting, typically by going to art school, where they're taught by those who are already practitioners. And young would-be composers learn the practice of composing. So too, young would-be icon painters learn the practice of icon painters. Young would-be violinists learn the practice of violin playing from those who are already practitioners. Young would-be curators of prints learn from their elders the practice of displaying prints, and so forth. So interlocking practices of composition, of presentation or performance, and of public engagement. <coughs> Let me introduce my second suggestion by referring to a passage in Arthur Danto's book, After the End of Art. As I mentioned earlier, Danto's awakening to the fact that something very new was happening in the world of the visual arts occurred when he first saw Andy Warhol's Brillo Box. He knew that many people would dismiss this as not art, but he felt instinctively that it was art. But that raised for him the question, why is this art? Whereas an ordinary Brillo Box that you can get in a supermarket is not. Art history, he observes, has assumed that you can see the difference between art and non-art. But here there's no difference to be seen. Danto concludes that the, must differ, that the difference must lie in what the mind can discern, but not the eye. Not being visually apprehensible, it must be mentally apprehensible. <laughs> and what is it in the Brillo box that made it art and that Danto apprehended mentally? Meaning, says Danto, meaning. What Brillo Box tells us, I quote, is that necessary for something having the status of art is for it to be about something and to embody its meaning. What makes something a work of art is that it embodies meaning. Danto worries a little bit, not very much, whether this is not only a necessary, but whether it's also a sufficient condition for something's being a work of art. I think it's pretty obvious that it's not sufficient. A philosophical text is also embodied meaning. Indeed, this lecture that I'm giving is embodied meaning, embodied in sound. But what I want to carry away from Dante is not a dispute over defining art, but rather his, is not his proposed definition of art, but rather his, his suggestion that to understand recent developments in the visual art world, the category of meaning is indispensable. The question that Duchamp's urinal posed flamboyantly to his viewers was, what does it mean? And what did he mean in presenting it for our viewing? What's it supposed to mean for us? So too, the question posed by Warhol's Brillo box was the question of meaning. What does it mean? What did he mean in presenting it to us for our viewing? And what's it supposed to mean for us? Now, I think that once we see that urinal and Brillo box pose the question of meaning, then it's but a short step to seeing that all works of art pose a question of meaning. The situation was not that the other works in that 1917 exhibition did not pose a question of meaning, 
whereas Fountain did pose a question of meaning. The situation was rather that the viewers would have known or would have thought they knew what those other works meant, and so they didn't have to be baffled by them. But now imagine somebody from isolated Amazon tribe being brought to that 1917 exhibition. He or she would have seen a lot of multicolored rectangles hanging on the walls, and they might have discerned that, I don't know, that some of these were of trees and some of mountains and so forth. But I submit that beyond that, they would have no idea as to what these colored triangles hanging on walls meant. I spent the academic year, parenthetically, I spent the academic year 1970-71 on sabbatical in London, beginning work on the book that became Works and Worlds of Art. One afternoon, I paid a visit on the eminent art historian Ernst Gombrich, then elderly. Gombrich asked what I was working on. I replied that I was working on meaning in art. Stay away from meaning, he responded emphatically. I heeded the warning. I now think that it was a mistake to heed his warning, or if maybe not a mistake then, a mistake to continue to do so. Now, meaning, meaning is a vague word. So let me say just a little bit about how I intend it to be understood here. Like everything else in this lecture, it could be discussed at much greater length. So consider the paintings, all of you know them, I suspect. You've seen images. You haven't seen them because we're not allowed them. The paintings in the Lascaux Caves in southern France. Though there's been a lot of speculation as to what they mean, I take it that the state of the discussion is that we don't really know. We're not completely in the dark, of course. We can see that they're representations of animals. But beyond that, we just don't know what these paintings mean. What do we have in mind when we say that we don't know what they mean? I think we mean that we don't know why the makers made these representations, nor why they made them as they did, such activity and flow. And we don't know whether it was expected that other members of the tribe would engage these paintings in some way, or whether just the artist did and then it was locked up. We don't know. If somehow we arrive at the conclusion that other members of the tribe did engage them, we don't know how and we don't know why. Nor do we know what the effects were on them, of, on the tribe, of engaging these paintings. In short, we're almost completely in the dark as to how the making of these representations fitted into the actions, intended and unintended, of the tribe that made them. I think it's in that, it's in that sense that we just know almost nothing of what they mean. Well, let me move toward a conclusion. The title I gave this talk is Rethinking Religion and Art. And in my opening comments, I said that one of the reasons for discarding the grand modern narrative of the arts is that it functions as a powerful hindrance to an accurate and adequate understanding of the interaction between art and religion. I suggested that achieving an accurate and adequate understanding of that interaction requires rethinking art. I've now set before you the broad outlines of how I think we should rethink art. What remains to be done is briefly pointing to how this rethinking opens up the possibility of a more accurate and adequate understanding of the interaction between art and religion. Shortly after I joined the Yale faculty in the fall of 1989, I participated in a discussion on religion and art. The unspoken conference, uh, uh, context for the conference was the grand narrative, though nobody called it that. The only art that anybody talked about was fine art, museum art, gallery art. And I must say that what struck me about the discussion was how labored it was. Getting clear on the relation between religion and art was thought to be difficult, very difficult. There was a good deal of talk about Willem de Koning and the religious significance of his art, abstract artist. Um, the religious significance of de Koning's paintings proved to be extremely elusive. It was very difficult to pin it down. It was all very hard work. Toward the end of the conference, I suggested that when the same group met again a year hence, we should discuss icons. I thought that would be much easier. It wouldn't be so difficult to see the connection between art and religion in the case of icons. The suggestion fell like a lead balloon. Complete silence. 
Nobody even ventured to express disagreement with me. It was as if I had committed some extremely embarrassing faux pas. So best for everybody to act as if I just hadn't said anything. I now understand much better than I did at the time why my suggestion received the response. Well, response is not the right word, the silence that it did. The grip of the grand narrative on the participants meant that talking about icons, I think, felt to them like slumming it. Let's talk about de Koning's paintings, not the icons of Rublev. Maybe the most important consequence of rethinking art along the lines I've suggested is that we will be, feel liberated to probe the meaning of icons, of Gregorian chant, of medieval altarpieces, of Genevan psalms, of Lutheran chorales, of Bach sacred cantatas, of African-American spirituals, the whole lot, that we'll feel free to do this with no sense of shame. That is to say, we'll be liberated to uncover their meaning in their home religious contexts, rather than talking about their meaning, if any, as episodes in the history of aesthetic stylistics. Let me add that we won't be starting from scratch here. Much has already been done, but not by philosophers, theologians, or art historians, anthropologists and people like that, historians. I think we're going to find ourselves liberated in another direction as well. History of art and the philosophy of art of the modern period, which shares the presuppositions of history of art, together reduce the meaning of the art produced by the modern West and of the art hanging in our museums and played in our concert halls, reduces their meaning to its, to its aesthetic meaning. But the meaning of these works for those who made them and for those who originally engaged them often went far beyond their aesthetic meaning. In recent years, there have been studies of the social and political meaning of some of these works. That, to my mind, already represents a welcome rethinking. But I submit that if we rethink art along the lines I've suggested, we will also be alert to the religious meaning that what we call fine art often had for its makers and for those who originally engaged it. Vincent van Gogh remarks in one of his letters to his brother Theo that he was painting God in the sun, S-U-N. Now rather than skipping over that as an embarrassing, somewhat addled irrelevance, I think we should ask what what was he getting at? And rather than acting, also acting embarrassed by Piet Mondrian's theosophy, I think we should ask how his theosophy entered into the meaning of his art. So in conclusion, I've argued that rejection of the grand modern narrative of the arts is forced on us not only by philosophical considerations, what do you mean obtaining its historical destiny? but also by developments over the past 50 plus years of, in, the, um, in the visual art world. The grand narrative is simply incapable of dealing with these developments. Now the radical pluralism of these developments makes the insistence of critics like Clement Greenberg that the ineluctable logic of stylistic history, I haven't had a chance to quote Greenberg here, means that there's just one way forward in visual art, everything else is a backwater makes that insistence on one way ahead seem, well, wan, wistful, and nostalgia. I have no doubt that what I've called the Duchamp Warhol line means that effusions of the sort I've quoted about the religious significance of art are probably at an end. I don't think anybody is inclined to compare looking at Duchamp's fountain to prayer. But on the other hand, I wonder whether this newfound pluralism might not also mean more acceptance of those present day artists for whom their religion is an important component of the meaning of their art. Fewer effusions of religiosity of, about art in general, more acceptance of religious meaning in the work of particular artists. Thank you.